Hey everybody, Mr. Marek here in our very first electricity video. I'm going to call this one electric forces um, or Coulomb's law because the first thing we need to understand about electricity is how charges interact with each other via forces. So we're going to kind of back way up to the ancient Greek times, which is typically where a lot of our things start. The word electro comes from the Greek word electrum, which means amber or fossilized tree sap. Now you may be wondering, what in the heck does fossilized tree sap have to do with electricity? Well, uh, uh, amber was the first thing that people noticed that when it was rubbed with something like animal fur, it would attract other objects, which was a really, really weird thing um, to you in ancient Greece if you still believed in the four elements, earth, fire, wind, and water, rather than understanding anything about atoms or modern scientific theory. So it was a very, very long time before anybody actually ever understood anything about these forces. Many years later, before careful experiments were done by a few people we know about and will learn about, that show that there are two possible inter that are two possible electric interactions. Electric interactions can be both attractive and repulsive. So the basic idea in our place to begin with is that electric forces are caused by things called charge. Charge is a fundamental property of nature. So that's the first thing we need to learn about electric charge. Charge is one of those things that's kind of hard to define. I'm going to try to give you a definition. I'm going to try to define charge as being the fundamental property of some particles, not all, that cause an electric force between them. So key word here in that definition is property. Charge is a property of some particles. To kind of boil it down a little bit simpler, Charge is what causes electric forces the same way that mass is what causes gravitational forces. So we learned um, previously that two masses will attract each other and we call that force gravity. Charges will attract or repel each other and we call that force the electric force. Now there are two kinds of charges and our basic rule for their interactions is that opposite charges will attract one another and like charges or similar charges will repel each other. Now we knew that for a few years, 100 years or so, uh, before some feller by the name of Benjamin Franklin came along and gave them names. And he named them positive and negative. Really those names are completely arbitrary they don't have any more significant meaning other than they are two things that are opposite. So he could have chose to use up and down or east and west for their names. Positive and negative is kind of the names that he chose. Today we understand, after a lot of study, understanding how atoms work, that protons are the thing that are positively charged, have the property of positive charge, and that electrons have the negative charge. Before, very recently, we really didn't know that. We kind of had to guess as to what was happening in any sort of electric situation. Now our picture is a little bit clearer due to our understanding of uh, subatomic particles like protons and electrons. A little bit more about electric charge. The symbol that we use is a Q we can use either a capital Q or a lowercase q. Typically, if we have a big charge, we'll use a capital Q. If we have a little charge, we'll use a lowercase q. The unit that we measure charge in is the Coulomb, which has the symbol capital C. To give you an idea of how big that unit is, the elementary charge is the value of the charge on a proton or an electron in Coulombs. We give it the symbol Q subscript E, and in Coulombs it has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs. So you can see that a Coulomb is a pretty large unit for charge, 
compared to the charge on an electron or a proton. In chemistry, you probably just assigned a proton or electron as having like a plus or minus one charge. In physics, we need to actually use the unit of Coulomb so that when we do um, forces, we get answers in newtons, and when we want energy, we get it to be in joules. So if you're going back and forth between physics and chemistry, make sure you keep that straight. Uh, one important thing about charge is that it has to be conserved. The net charge of a closed system has to remain constant. So mass is conserved, charge is similar to mass, charge is conserved as well. Now don't say that charge can't be created or destroyed. What the conservation law really tells us is that the net charge of a system remains constant. We'll discuss that in more detail later on. So this Frenchman by the name of Charles Coulomb basically figured out a relationship to describe electric forces. He assumed that the electric force would be like gravity and that it would obey an inverse square law. So remember, an inverse square law means if we take two charges, separate them by a distance r, and then we take the same two charges and separate them by a distance 2r, so in other words, we double the separation between them, then the electric force between them would be decreased by one-fourth. So we go from F to F over 4 for the electric force. In other words, you assume that the electric force is proportional to 1 over the distance between the charges squared. And that kind of a rule is called an inverse square rule. Remember, gravity follows the same rule. So the electric force is also going to depend on the amount of charge in both objects. We can label those Q1 and Q2. Making charge bigger would make the force bigger. So we can say that F is proportional to the product of the two charges. And so we can start to kind of write an equation. We can say that the electric force is equal to the product of the charges over the distance between them squared. But in order for our answer to be in newtons, we need to introduce some sort of constant. And the constant we introduce is K, capital K, and capital K is referred to, creatively enough, as the charge constant. Its value, which is something we would have to measure, is 9 times 10 to the 9th, so that's like a really big number, and the unit is newton times meters squared over coulomb squared. Now, this equation only gives us the size or magnitude of the electric force. We really can't tell anything about the direction. We have to use our rules that opposite attract, likes repel. And so, typically, that's written in absolute value bars like that because we don't want to assume that we can get a sign out of that. Um, and so, it only tells us how big the force is, not what direction it's in. Last thing, if you compare the value of K to the other constant of nature important in determining forces, which is big G, universal gravitational constant, you would see that K is like really, 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 really big. It's like 10 to the 20th times bigger than G. So the electric force, because that constant is real big, is gargantuan, super duper large. I always like that word gargantuan just rarely have a chance to use it in a sentence. So it's important to understand that electric forces are like super duper big. So let's look at an example. Suppose that we have a proton 0.2 meters to the right of an object that's got a charge of negative 4 times 10 to the 6 coulombs. The question is what is the force on the proton? So if we kind of drew a picture, there's the um, negative 4 times 10 to the negative 6 coulomb charge. There's our proton. And when we see the word proton, that needs to clue us in that this is the value of its charge. 
and we know that the proton is going to be attracted to that charge because opposites attract. And so I'm going to use Coulomb's law, Fe equals kq1 q2 over r squared equation. I'm going to call the big charge charge q. So since it's big, I'm going to make it a capital Q. And the little charge, I'll use the symbol little q. And then r squared is the distance between them. And so it's kind of typical to use a big Q for a big charge and a small Q for a small charge. It's just one way to keep them straight. So plugging in my numbers will look something like that. Notice right here I did not plug in the negative sign because the negative sign is not going to make a difference in there. Remember that the Coulomb's Law equation only gives us the size of the force, not the direction. So don't plug in negatives into Coulomb's Law. So you crunch the numbers, you get something like that, which is actually a, a really big force for a proton. The meters cancel out. The Coulombs will cancel out. And so the reason that K has that kind of funny looking unit is so the meters and Coulombs will cancel out giving me my answer in newtons. And then since I know opposites attract, I know that the direction of the force is going to be to the left. So next question, how do objects actually get this property of charge? In other words, how do things become charged? We kind of need to differentiate between the word charge and charge de with a d. When an object is charged, that means it has an imbalance of charge. If an object has more positive charges, then we say it is positively charged. And if it is negatively charged, then we say that it has more negatives. Now, the thing we have to realize is that all objects, including you, possess charge. And we know this because everything is made up of atoms. I can't think of anything that's not made up of an atom. And atoms are made up of protons and electrons. Most objects, however, are overall electrically neutral, meaning they have the same number of positive charges as negative charges. So here's a picture of something that's neutral. If we count the charges, you'll see there's the same number of positive and negatives. This is something that's positively charged. You can tell there's more positive charges in that object than negatives. And this is something that's negatively charged. It's got more negatives than it does positive. So how do objects actually become charged if all things have charge to begin with? One way is to simply rub charges from one surface to another. This is basically based on a material's affinity to collect extra charges. So a good example of that is rubbing fur on a balloon, running your sweatshirt, rubbing your sweatshirt on a balloon. So here's a picture of fur being rubbed on a balloon. Both the fur and the balloon start out with positive and negative charges. But afterwards, we would find more negative charges on the balloon than we would on the fur. Some of the negative charges are pulled onto the surface of the balloon. That makes the balloon negatively charged and the fur positively charged. Now, in general, this little trick works well with insulators. And insulators are materials that don't allow charges to move through them. For for example, if you replace the balloon with an aluminum can, aluminum can is a conductor, um, then you wouldn't really see this effect. You wouldn't see anything happen, really. And so this works really well with conductors like plastics, rubbers, um, nylons, things like that. That's why this happens a lot with your clothes when you put them in the dryer. They rub together, they gather an excess of charge, and then they stick to your leg or you get socks clinging to your shirt um, and things like that. The second way to transfer charge is via conduction. Conduction simply refers to the process of charges spreading out through a conductor. 
the definition of a conductor is a material that will allow charges to move through it. Typically, when we think of conductors, we think of metals. Metals are very good conductors. Um, silver is the best conductor that's common to us, with copper being a close second. That's why we make wires out of copper. So here's a picture of a negatively charged conductor. If we touch it to a positively charged conductor, since they're conductors, that means charges can move back and forth between them. The charges are going to spread out so that they are kind of equally spaced. Basically, all those extra negative charges, because negative charges will repel each other, are going to spread out so they'll occupy both spheres, making both spheres negatively charged. This is a very important process. Um, later on, we're going to call this an electric current, and that's the thing that's happening inside of wires. So, for example, if you're listening to this on a speaker, there are charges moving through the wires of that speaker, and somehow, some way, that makes sound. We'll learn how that process uh, works later on. The third way to charge an object is via a process called induction. Induction refers to when charges move in a conductor, so similar to conduction. The difference is when it's charged excuse me, when it's caused by other charges nearby. So for instance, if we took two neutral spheres, which are conductors, and then we took a negatively charged rod, like a rod we rub with fur to make it negatively charged, if we brought the rod close, but not touching, to those two spheres, the negatives inside the spheres would be attracted to the rod, the positives in the spheres would be repelled by it, and so we get something that looked more like that. Negatives move over to the sphere on the left, and the ch positive charges move over to the sphere on the right. When that happens, the left sphere becomes negatively charged, the right sphere becomes positively charged, and we say that the charges have been separated by induction. Now, this is a temporary pro temporarily this is only temporarily, gosh, um, because if we took the rod away, then the charges would just go back to where they came from, and so they would kind of balance each other out again. And so if we went back from the rod being close to the rod being far away, then the charges would go back to being evenly distributed between the two spheres. The spheres would go back to being neutral. So that's all for this time. On our next lesson, we'll put this in the context of electric fields, and we'll make it a little bit more general. So until then, ta-ta.